since 1951. We have our one of our original members here with us tonight, Brown Bassford, who will ask to say a few words. Brown, um, in commemoration of somewhat of this event, I appreciate all of you coming and bringing your support over the years. And if you're new to the college, it consists of the following format. First, there'll be an announcements period. Second, our speaker will be introduced and speak up to an hour, but he is still en route to us. And third, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period with the last word being given by the speaker. My name is Tim. I'll be kind of moderating tonight, helping out around here. But first, I'd like to bring up, I'd like to uh, have Brown Bassford say a few words and what he thinks about the college. If he, can, if he wants to come on up, that's fine. If not, I'll uh, bring a microphone to him. Let's, uh, well, let's welcome him. Like, Ron, you coming up? Can I say what I think of all of you? Tim, can we get more volume? Yes. Can you, can you get a little more volume, please? All right. Ron is coming up, but he's going to be saying a few words for us tonight. Brom was the illustrious host of this of this event for many, many years. And I know he's now kind of having a little trouble getting around and he's in a nursing home, but he is here and he deserves a round of applause and honor for helping to keep this institution running well. We would like you to say a few words of wisdom and maybe just give us a few words of what you think about the college and what it's been like and what you learned from it over the years. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I uh, uh, shouldn't stand too long. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad of the food. I'm glad of the company. I'm glad to see people like uh, uh, Jan uh, from uh, the uh, news and letters and uh, 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 people of various backgrounds and so on. Margaret uh, has said, uh, Mike, Charlie, oh my goodness, you're all here. And some of you are, are looking pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, somehow you managed to keep uh, coming to these things, and I hope that you're contributing uh, in your uh, not only with your presence, but uh, with your ideas. And speaking of, and I see Joe Messick, whom I missed uh, the other day at the the Jane Adams Senior Caucus. Uh, I know that uh, Gene Horker will tell you about uh, some of the events that the Jane Adams Senior Caucus is running. Uh, oh, hi there. Uh, it's good to see you back. Um, the, uh, uh, Carlos has been going around doing the, my old job of collecting. Uh, but if he missed you, uh, you can always wave your hand at him. I'm sure that he'll be glad to see you. Uh, uh, there. Uh, what can I say about uh, the proof? It's good to have a time where you can sit down and uh, listen to somebody and uh, also contribute a little something of your own perspective. And we come from so many different perspectives that uh, 
It's, it can be great to contribute. Uh, so I encourage you all to speak up. Now I would like, if Charlie is back there, I'd like him to come up and say a few words too while we wait and wait for our speaker. Uh, uh, you want to go to announcements then, Charlie? Yeah, I, know, I got nothing to say to any <laughs> Typical Charlie. Well, it's about time. Yeah, Andy says I, I give up too much. All right. Andy. We'll uh, get Andy as soon as he gets uh, in here. I myself am shocked that I've been coming for well over 20 years to this college atmosphere. It started out in 1998. And just as a reminder, we got college episodes going all the way back to 2010 on the College of Complexes website. You just click on the link to the link to videos. And we also have a thriving campus at uh, Dallas. There also two have been, I think, up in the meeting of like three or four hundred. They've been around for a little while too. And I have been down there myself, and it too is thriving, so maybe we might one of these days get a third venture. Um, I don't know if David Randy Steele has arrived yet, but uh, <laughs> if he's not on his way, but if Andy would like to come up and say a few words, I'd love to have him. Remember, this is meeting 3,500 of the College of Complexes, and we are celebrating a milestone of sorts here tonight. Okay, Andy, if you want to come up and say a few words, uh, I know you'll, this isn't a formal announcement period yet, but uh, I'd like you to say a few words about what you think of the college and meaning 3,500. Well, from my point of view, the college is a meeting place where people come to exchange information and learn stuff that they didn't know about. Uh, the exposed information that they can't get in the mainstream media and my particular expertise is translating books. We call it database translation. We take five or ten books on a subject, my brother and I, and publish one or two page briefing papers. So it's not a cliff note summary of one book, it's a one or two page summary of a scientific database. I'm a translator. When I give you a fact from thousands of scientists, it's not my opinion. It's a fact. And that's the hardest thing that people have had trouble understanding. Um, they verbally attack me for giving them facts that are inconvenient to their worldview that's presented by the mainstream media. Incidentally, the new Censor News book, the 2019 edition, is, came out uh, October 4th. Everybody can see that. That's got the top 25 most censored stories of the year, the last year, from uh, the mainstream media that would change America overnight in a heartbeat if these stories were covered rather than blacked out. This is the 41st anniversary edition. Project Center has been up and running out of Sonoma State University for more than 40 years. So if you want to know what's happening, this edition, incidentally, is dedicated to fighting the fake news invasion from the Trump administration. There's a bunch of articles and uh, chapters in this book that helps you develop the tools to differentiate between fake news and real news. And it's loaded with sources of real news. I've just, just about finished uh, listening to a book on tape, or actually CD. <clears throat> the best environmental book out that I know of is this thing uh, called This Changes Everything from Naomi Klein. It's an education about what's happening around the world with global warming, climate change, and it gives you detailed information about how to talk to somebody that, who is a climate denier. You know, there are people in this country that, the climate deniers are really two categories, people that are unaware of the facts and they're maintaining themselves in a bubble of ignorance, and then the people in the media that are what, what are referred to now as intellectual prostitutes. They're paid to lie to us on critical subjects so the public doesn't mobilize and do something about the billionaire fossil fuel criminals. So if anybody uh, wants any more information on any of this stuff, I'll be at the back. <clears throat> this, I just got this book this week. It's brand new. It's called Ground Zero Wars. 
by Jenna Orkin is the fight to reveal the lies of the EPA in the wake of 9-11 and clean up the lower Manhattan. This book describes how the government lied to the firemen, policemen, first responders, and everybody that was working at the site to clean up the World Trade Center so that Wall Street could get back up and running. Uh, the American uh, were on the way to having 40,000 dead, maybe more, among the first responders that breathed that polluted air. At least 10 times the number of lives lost in the attacks themselves. So, if I, I have cards with these websites on. If anybody wants one, I'll be at the back desk or you can see me afterwards. So, uh, anybody has any questions, uh, see me later. All right, Tim's going to say a few words. All right, Andy, we'll consider that uh, also your announcement from the announcements period. Yes. All right. Not exactly what I was asking for, but uh, Hello, boy, Andy. Right. I was giving a round of applause to Andy, and I, I strictly heard other views on this stuff myself. I still believe it was 12 terrorists and knocked down the buildings, but uh, this is not the time to do that. Uh, let's get right now into our announcements period, and then... We will still wait for our speaker to come on up, but uh, let's go away and start with the announcements. No, I went back. Where's our speaker? He's on his, he's en route. We don't know where he's at, but he's notorious for being late. So round of our applause to one of our institutions here, Heather, who's been serving us for the last three or four years. So we'll be seeing you today, Heather, or... Thank you, guys. Tipper well, she really doesn't. Charlie is still my schedule, but I'll uh, have to get another one. All right. Um, well, there's one right there. Where? Yeah, one. Yeah. You could be looking at one. Thank you, Charlie. All right, Mr. Steele, are you ready tonight and uh, got yourself situated? We're going to be tonight's topic is the good and bad in Jordan Peterson one of the most effective voices against the extreme left. Yes. Jordan Peterson is a Canadian psychology professor who has suddenly become a superstar of social media with millions of followers and one of the most effective voices against the extreme left. He represents both the intellectual reaction against political correctness and the death of traditional media, newspapers and TV, who do dominant role in public debate has been taken over by sites like YouTube and Twitter. In 2016, the Canadian government introduced a bill called C-16, which sought to extend anti-discrimination law to gender. Peterson claimed that C-16 compelled the use of new gender terms for trans people according to their preference, and Peterson argued that this is a dangerous violation of free speech. In September 2016, Peters started putting out videos on YouTube criticizing C-16 and political correctness in general. His popular book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, is released in January 2018 and has sold millions of copies throughout the world, topping bestseller charts in the UK, US, and Canada. Peterson receives hundreds of letters every week from the general gist of many of these letters is, You Saved My Life. Dr. Rams, Dr. David Ramsey Steele, author of Orwell Your Orwell, the study of George Orwell's thought, will accurately explain Peterson's thinking and separate the wheat from the chaff. Let's welcome to the podium with a proud round of applause, Dr. David Ramsey Steele. Well, need some water, sir? Fellow members of the human species, and anybody else who might happen to be paying attention. Um, that was a good introduction to what I'm going to say. I wonder who wrote it. It sounded very cogent. So I won't repeat all that. Um, so I'm going to say something about Jordan Peterson, who I think is an important cultural phenomenon. Um, Peterson 
uh, always says that he isn't right wing, but the left say he's a fascist, a Nazi, a white, a white nationalist, a white supremacist, a sexist, a racist, a homophobe, a transphobe, a misogynist, and an Islamophobe. So he can't be all bad. Um, now, he calls himself a, a classical liberal, uh, and that is my political position. For those of you who don't know, classical liberal means the same as libertarian, it's roughly the same thing. And classical liberal was the original liberal position. People like John Stuart Mill uh, were classical liberals. Uh, I just clarify what, before I get on to the main body of what I'm going to say, I'll just clarify a few things about Peterson. He, he's he's uh, constantly uh, releasing new talks, lectures, interviews, and other uh, kind of um, presentations on YouTube, which is where I mainly keep up with what he's doing and saying. Um, and almost none of this is about politics. So although he, although he became famous because of this um, C-16, which was a political measure introduced into Canada to compel people to use certain pronouns, um, he actually says very little about politics. I mean, I've never heard him say anything about um, immigration or uh, tariffs. Um, I did hear him say that he was glad that uh, since Trump was elected, we hadn't got into any new uh, wars, new useless wars. He thought that was good. And I thought, well, but we haven't got out of the existing new useless wars either, like in, in Syria and Afghanistan. That's, that's what I'm looking forward to. But. Um, uh, but you have to understand, if you're going to understand Peterson, that although a lot of right-wing people like him, he says very little about politics. Um, he, he's like a rock star when he goes on tour. He goes on tour with Dave Rubin, uh, and um, they fill big stadiums, and he, he talks. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to I'm going to be examining his ideas. I should say something about his position on the trans question. I would say that, um, as far as I understand it, I'm in agreement with his position, which is that uh, classical liberal view is that people are entitled to do whatever they want. Uh, adults, that is to say, are entitled to do whatever they want, as long as they don't invade the rights of other people. And those rights don't include the right not to be offended. So. Uh, merely because a lot of people disapprove of some behavior is no reason that it shouldn't be um, fully permitted by law. So uh, I, I agree with Peterson on this. Now, um, uh, where, where he came into a clash with this whole, um, where he began to be called a transphobe was because he objected to being compelled to use certain pronouns. Now, in, 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 in case you haven't been following this, the number of pronouns that exist to distinguish different kinds of genders is now ex well exceeds 100. Um, and, um, and some of them include uh, animal kin, you know, and uh, kin with the, with the little people, the fairies and leprechauns. Uh, so, and, and um, in many uh, jurisdictions, legislation has either been passed, like in New York, or, uh, or is impending, to compel everybody to, use, to call people by um, their preferred pronouns. And these, so I say, there's more than 100 of these pronouns, and they, they keep proliferating. Um, so, um, uh, so, Peterson always said that if someone came up to him when he was lecturing, uh, in psychology at, at the university and said, I'd like to be called by this pronoun, he would agree, he would agree to it. Uh, but he doesn't, he, what he objects to is having a law that compels using these pronouns. He thinks that's a matter of a personal decision. And that's my view too. So, um, before I get into the main body of what, I, what I'd like to say, I just want to make a few random observations about Peterson. Um, Peterson uh, um, comes across as defending religion, but when put to it, when he's cornered and interrogated by people, 
um, it becomes apparent that he doesn't actually believe in any religion. Uh, but he has this idea that religion gives meaning to people's lives, and therefore religious stories are worth uh, dwelling upon, analyzing, uh, being preoccupied with, because that will give meaning to our lives. Um, one criticism I would make of what he says about religion is that, and this is true of the, the new atheists and many other groups that, that have become uh, prominent, is that he equates religion with God. Uh, and this, I think, is a very um, myopic uh, kind of view. Uh, there, are a lot, there are atheistic religions like Buddhism, Jainism. Um, there are religions which are sometimes described as having many gods, but I think like Shinto in, in Japan, which I think it would be more correct to say they're nature spirits. They, they're not gods in the full-blooded sense that we think of gods. Uh, if you look around the world, you know, you've got the Chinese who are a fifth of the world's population, and uh, the great majority of them have no belief in a god, and haven't had for, for thousands of years. Um, except they, some of them believe in nature spirits, some of them believe in worshipping their ancestors, uh, but the idea of a god who created the universe is completely alien to Chinese traditional way of thinking. And the same is true of many uh, groups of people throughout the world. So to, so, so to equate religion with God, as, as Peterson does, I think it, it's, a, it's a common error, but I think it is an error. Uh, and I think that uh, the great majority of human beings who have ever lived didn't believe in a God. They, believed, they had a belief in a spirit world, but this spirit world was populated by sprites and, and demons and, uh, and uh, uh, nature spirits of various kinds. Um, and, you know, this, this is not the spirit. So this is a mistake, I think, Peterson makes when he, he's, and when, when cornered, he will say that uh, God is whatever you value most highly. And he will say that there's a hierarchy, everybody has a hierarchy of values, and the top value that trumps all the others is your God. Well, first of all, I think that's a loose metaphorical way of talking that can be very misleading. It's just an analogy. Secondly, uh, you can have a hierarchy of values without one value being supreme. Because I, I think when you get to the top, there can be a trade-off between, a, 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 which I think is true in my case, a number of different values uh, without one of them being utterly dominant. So you can say, well, that group of values is my God, but uh, what, what are you accomplishing by this curious way of talking? Um, so, another thing about Peterson that I've noticed is that he tends to reduce good and evil in the world to a question of motivation. Um, he likes to quote somebody who I happen to know a bit about, uh, George Orwell, in The Road to Wigan Pier. And George Orwell make, makes the point that socialists don't really love the poor. That's, that's something that Orwell throws out in in uh, the road to William Pier. And, uh, and Orwell criticizes the motives of socialists in that book. Um, what Peterson doesn't seem to realize is that in that book, where the very book where Orwell criticizes the motivations of socialists he knows, um, he's announcing his conversion to socialism. And um, Peterson suggests that, that, that he had, that, this is what a lot of people say, Orwell had socialist sympathies. No, from 1936 until his death in 1951, Orwell was a dogmatic, doctrinaire socialist who believed that um, socialism involved the ownership of virtually everything by the government, everybody becoming a government employee, everybody having roughly equal uh, salary, um, and so on. He also thought it included uh, democracy, civil liberties, and things like that. But it was a set. So he had a very, um, by our standards today, not by the standards of the 1930s, where these ideas were very popular, but by our standards today, uh, he had a very uh, narrow and extreme view of socialism, and he stuck to it. So Orwell criticized socialists, but he was fully defensive of uh, socialism. And by the way, I think that's right. I don't think the reason to go against any political ideology 
uh, is because of the motives of its supporters. Um, <clears throat> because I think that um, institutions have consequences. So if you set up, set up a central planning agency to tell everybody what to do, that's going to have certain consequences. And one of those consequences, ultimately, is going to be mass murder. Uh, so I, I don't, that the, the motives of the, uh, of the people who favor this may be that they want a wonderful world without strife, without wars, and so on. And, uh, but that's not necessarily what they're going to get. They're going to get what the, that institution determines. So, um, Peterson often says that he's against the idea that happiness is a is the major goal in life. So, uh, I think he's wrong. I think happiness is one of the most important goals in life. Uh, and so, the ancient Greek philosophers, virtually all of them, thought that happiness was the goal of life, and I think they were right. Some of them argued for it strongly, like Aristotle and the Stoics. Uh, others just took it for granted. Uh, but <clears throat> Peterson is against that. And um, the argument he gives is a very strange one. He says that life is, life, he often reiterates that life is suffering. Uh, and if you make um, happiness your goal, you're going to be disappointed because sooner or later you're going to meet a disaster, a calamity, some horrible thing. Uh, and I would say there, well, happiness in the inclusive sense includes <coughs> minimizing suffering. Uh, that's part of this pursuit of happiness idea. Uh, so uh, if something terrible happens, uh, there are ways you can minimize uh, the suffering that that causes. Uh, so it, it, that doesn't, it doesn't contradict the idea that happiness is a, is a, <coughs> a great goal of life. Um, He's very famous, and one of his most famous themes is saying, go clean up your room. Uh, and that became a cliche after he said it. But of course, it was people have been saying that for centuries anyway, to, to uh, adolescents. Um, uh, at least since the living standards rose high enough that most adolescents had a separate room. Um, so so he, he's full of this idea that uh, you know, he, look, he looks at the, at the, at the crazy left, uh, and he says, uh, uh, you know, these, these empty-headed young people uh, don't know anything, and they propose to, dra to drastically overhaul everything in the world. Why don't they start by cleaning up their room? Um, well, that, that has a certain appeal, but I, I think ultimately, it's immaterial. Uh, I don't, you know, you may end up with people with si equally crazy leftist ideas who uh, clean up their room. So what? What have you accomplished? Um, so, so basically, uh, I'm, in, so I'm mentioning these points where I'm in disagreement with with um, Peterson. Um, he he claims to be a cognitive behavior. He, he doesn't do it anymore, but years ago, for many years, he did psychotherapy, as well as teaching uh, cognitive psychology. Uh, and it, as everybody will know who's read my book, uh, which I wrote with two psychotherapists, Therapy Breakthrough, uh, there are basically, today, there are two kinds of psychotherapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy and a psychodynamic therapy, which ultimately derives from people like Freud and Jung. Um, and <clears throat> Peterson claims to be a practitioner of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, but I don't see any evidence of this whenever he talks about therapy. I, I see him as a closet psychodynamic person. Uh, and <clears throat> he believes in uh, Jungian archetypes. When I first started thinking I might say something about Peterson in public, I thought it, it was important to um, come up with my theory for why Jungian archetypes uh, is a false theory, why there are no Jungian archetypes. Um, but then I eventually began to realize that although Peterson thinks that he believes in Jungian archetypes uh, and mentions Jung quite a lot, um, he's, he's mistaken. Uh, he does believe in the great importance of stories, images, typical situations which recur in the culture. 
Uh, and uh, but that is in itself doesn't uh, doesn't imply a belief in Jungian archetypes. So I would only say there that Jung, Carl Jung believed that we are genetically programmed with certain typical situations or with the propensity to think in terms of certain uh, typical situations. Um, and Jung believed that it was very important to his theory to prove uh, that these that this t propensity was innate, that it was genetically uh, determined. Um, uh, and he tried to argue against alternative explanations. Now it is true that certain, if you look at mythology, folklore, uh, children's stories, religious stories in the Bible and so on, you do find certain situations recur. <clears throat> but I would say that there, is, there are two blades that tend to uh, crush out the whole idea of archetypes. One is that the number of interesting si typical situations in human experience is fairly limited. Uh, you know, um, two men love the same woman, so one of the men kills the other man. How many times has that happened over the past few million years? Um, and uh, things like that. You can name these uh, situations. Uh, and that's just because uh, um, it's just the obvious point that the range of possible situations is very limited. Um, so, on the other hand, at the other extreme, the other blade of, of determine, determining these things is culture, cultural transmission. Uh, stories begin in one culture, but then that culture has contact with another culture, and the stories are transmitted. So. Between those two things, typical situations plus cultural transmission, I don't think there's any room left for Jungian archetypes. Uh, but anyway, it's, um, <clears throat> it, that would be redundant because I don't think anything that Peterson says actually rests on Jungian archetypes, although he thinks it does. So, um, now I'm going to go on to my main critique of Peterson. Um, you might be wondering what Peterson talks about. He talks at great length, he gives long lectures. Um, basically, what he, what he talks about is the, the following. He, he tells you how to live your life. Uh, and he's not shy about um, uh, telling you this. So uh, this book is his bestseller, sold millions of copies, uh, 12 Rules for Life. And he's, Give me a minute, okay? I, I saw him interviewed recently, and he's got a, new, a sequel to this. And I don't know whether he was joking or not. I, I sadly suspect he wasn't. He said it was going to be called 12 more rules for life. Were you ready? <laughs> so I guess, I guess that's, uh, um, that's the way, if you've had a great bestseller, why not, why not uh, capitalize on it uh, to write the sequel? So he constantly tells us how we should live our lives and uh, what we should do. Um, and a lot of what he, what he says is fairly commonplace, uh, so it's not, it's not all that interesting um, because it's been said many times before and uh, uh, it's not um, most, of, most of the stuff he talks about. Some of it's obscure exactly what he means, but um, most of the time it's fairly, it's fairly commonplace and unexceptionable. But what he does is he brings in stories, especially Bible stories. Uh, but also, he will mention other religious tradition stories. He will mention things like the Lion King um, and uh, po so popular culture stories as well. Um, and he, so he has this idea that um, our lives, there's, there's always a danger that our, our lives will lack meaning. And we get meaning from these stories. And these stories have something to do, they have some um, <coughs> connection with how we should live our lives. So, <clears throat> I'm going to look at the whole idea of stories and what the importance they might have. Um, <clears throat> so, if, you, if we're looking at a particular story, uh, I, should, I should say this, that, he, that Peterson will spend easily three or four hours talking about, for example, uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Right, in the, uh, early in the book of Genesis, the, the Eve is tempted by the snake, and they both uh, they both eat the um, the forbidden fruit, 
and then they booted out of the paradise. So, um, booted out of the Garden of Eden by God. So, um, he will spend like three or four hours at a stretch talking about that story. Uh, and you can find these things on YouTube. Uh, and there will be long digressions uh, where he's um, talking about all kinds of things that are rather remote. But, he, but still, he's actually giving a four-hour talk about this little story from the Bible and why it's important. Uh, so this is this is this is his um, this is his gig. This is his act, and that's what he does. Um, and it all it always comes back to how we should live our lives. So I've been thinking about this. Peterson has provoked me to think about this phenomenon of using stories to instruct us on how we should live our lives. And um, one of the things I think is rather slippery in Peterson, and inter an interesting sort of area to look at, is what does a story mean? Um, if we ask what a story, what's the story about, everybody here knows the story of Adam and Eve, or knows the very rough outline at least. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so, I think there are a number of separate questions we can, uh, we can distinguish. Uh, what did the story mean to the person who first thought of it, or, or, or who first wrote it down? That would be, that would be a question. Um, what has the story predominantly meant to people who have maintained the tradition of telling that story. So uh, the story of Adam and Eve existed for at least a thousand years, maybe more, uh, before Christianity came along. So it was a Jewish traditional story. It was in the Torah, which is the most respected part of the Tanakh, which is the Jewish scriptures, which Christians call the Old Testament. Um, so it was kept going by, well, there weren't rabbis in those days. So it was kept going by, uh, by uh, religious leaders. Um, and priests in the temple and so on. Um, and um, what did they think of it? But then Christianity came along, and uh, Christianity um, reconceived this story. And one of the things I've noticed about Peterson is that he knows a lot about research into cognitive psychology. But there are other areas where he doesn't really want to um, prejudice his conclusions by becoming too familiar with the basic elements of the subject he's studying. Um, and this is true uh, with Bible stories. Um, he misses a lot of important things. And one thing he misses is that, uh, I mean, he has a Protestant background and he sees these Old Testament Bible stories in a Protestant light, which often does violence to the way that they were they were, the stories were originally conceived. I mean, for example, simple example would be, he mentions several times when he's talking about the Garden of Eden story, he mentions original sin. So he, it's clear, if you read what he says and listen to what he says, he does not understand that the, the writers of the Tanakh didn't have a theory of original sin. That came along with Christianity. It's completely absent from the Tanakh. Um, so, um, you know, and he doesn't realize that um, the writers of the Tanakh uh, didn't have a concept of a devil, meaning uh, an angel who rebelled against God and set up his kingdom in hell. Um, uh, they, they did have a concept of Satan, but Satan in the Old Testament is 100% uh, an agent of God. Um, it's true, he's a troublemaker, but he makes trouble only on God's orders. And, you know, um, so, um, so, you know, he's there to make trouble. Um, and um, I was quite amused, therefore, when I, after I realized this, that Peterson d didn't understand the, the, how, by Christianizing a story like the Garden of Eden, you're doing violence to the original meaning. Now, you can do that, I'm not arguing that he shouldn't be able to do that, but he doesn't know he's doing it. Um, so, one of the things he says in one place is that he only began to, uh, he only began to understand the, the Garden of Eden story when he read Paradise Lost. Right? Now, Paradise Lost uh, is a very famous poem by John Milton. It was written in the 1660s. Uh, 
uh, Milton was not just a Christian, he was a Protestant. He was not just a Protestant, he was a Puritan. Um, so he had a very specific take on the, uh, and if you read Paradise Lost, um, it's, a tw it's in 12 books. And uh, the snake only starts making the, these um, uh, tempting suggestions to Eve in book nine. So what's going on for the first eight books? What's going on for the first eight books is that Satan, who is a devil, of course, in Christian idea, Christian mythology, is a devil, uh, who, and cr Satan is organizing like a colonial project to take over hell and set up this city called Pandemonium. That's where we get the word Pandemonium from, meaning all the demons. That's where all the demons live under Satan's control. This is when Satan says in the poem, uh, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Uh, which is something I actually have some sympathy with. Uh, uh, but I would say better to neither reign nor serve, but to have a very equitable relationship with a lot of uh, 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 associates. But anyway, this is, this is Paradise Lost. Um, so uh, this leads to all kinds of uh, conclusion uh, about the story. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in stories for their own sake. Uh, and this is something Peterson doesn't really talk about, but I think that these traditional stories are like pieces of music. They, they can be appreciated for what they are. Uh, and I would say you shouldn't do violence to the story. You should try and see what the story is actually saying. So, so, so these are some of the things. What did the story mean originally? What did it mean to a later tradition that adapted it? What does it mean when stripped down literally to what it says? If you look closely at some of these Bible stories, at exactly what they say, uh, you're sometimes surprised. I mean, for example, let's take a quick poll. You know the Garden of Eden story, right? Eve eats the fruit and then gives it to Adam. Adam eats the fruit. And then God comes along and says, uh, where, why are you hiding? And they said, because, yeah. because we're naked. And, they, and he said, well, how did you find out you were naked? Well, because... Um, that woman that you gave me made me uh, eat this fruit. Um, so then they're expelled. Now, what, why are they expelled from the Garden of Eden? I read this story. Of, uh, that's a good answer, but it's not what I'm thinking of. It actually, it actually gives the reason in the story, quite literally. There's a verse in Genesis 3 that explains precisely why God expels them from Eden. And that's not the answer. That's right, that's right. Who said that? Yes, that's right. That's the answer. What God, is is, God says, uh, if we don't watch out, God sometimes speaks to in the plural, and it's not quite clear who he's addressing. Um, they're going to eat from the tree of life. And the implication is that's going to be very bad. And it's one of several points in the Old Testament where God is clearly nervous that humans might supplant him by becoming too by becoming too powerful. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's the reason that's given in the story for why they have to be expelled, because they might, uh, if they're not expelled, they're going to eat from the tree of life. Uh, so uh, this, this is the kind of thing that you discover if you just pay attention to the story and don't have preconceptions and don't try to make it say uh, what you think it ought to say. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, and, uh, now another, 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 Thing we might mean by what does this story mean? Another thing we might mean is this is a very recent, it's the last 60 or 70 years, uh, but it's typical of academia today that uh, ev everything has infinite, almost infinitely many or certainly very many uh, legitimate readings. So what, what is one of the many possible legitimate readings? Uh, so this is, this is the prevailing dogma in, in sort of uh, literary studies today. So, you know, um, I don't know when it was, about 40 years ago, I guess. Um, there is a branch of, uh, of culture studies or literary studies called queer theory. Uh, and it's, um, it, it's basically, um, it's uh, very much uh, a, a field that is dominated by people who are interested in 
male homosexuality. And one of the, I forget the guy's name now, but one of them put forward the following theory. Now, I'm not making this up. This is a respected academic paper. Um, it was a, a, an article about um, the movie with James Stewart, <coughs> Rear Window. And the article explained how the whole movie was about anal intercourse. <laughs> Which is fairly obvious, really. Rear Window. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, uh, so the, thi the thing about this is, um, if you were to talk to the author, I'm sure, I'm, I, I don't know for certain, but I'm speculating, if you were to talk to the author of that paper or someone who thought it was a great paper, uh, a great article, and, and say, uh, they would say, oh no, that this is just one of a thousand possible readings, but it's a legitimate reading. Uh, so, you know, that would, that would be what they would probably say. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say, this is the way to read the movie script, Rear Window. They'd say, it's one of many readings, and this is the one I choose to focus on. Uh, so that's, that's a common view uh, in <coughs> modern languages departments, uh, literature departments. Um, uh, so that's, that's another way to go. Um, and then, <coughs> and then the, the, the sort of... Another, another way of looking at this, what is the meaning of this story, would be what does it mean to us today? Or what's the most likely way we would interpret it if we heard this story today? So those are some, those are five different ways of conceiving what it, what it means to talk about the meaning of the story. Um, now, I think once you start thinking about this analytically, like as I'm doing now, you realize that Peterson keeps on shifting around in when he talks about the meaning of a story. Um, he, you know, and um, he's, he's rather slippery. And uh, so <clears throat> this, makes, this makes it difficult to evaluate what he's saying because you don't know. He talks about, oh, I finally discovered the meaning of this, uh, and it's this. Uh, but what does that mean? Well, we don't really know. Um, <clears throat> Now, of course, uh, one big uh, extreme version of, uh, uh, would be that we think the story is true. And I suppose for many centuries, people did think the story of Adam and Eve was precisely what had happened. Uh, and that, that will certainly make you think in a certain way that won't, you won't think that way if you don't think that that's what, precisely what happened, right? Um, but, but that's one obvious uh, possibility. And uh, certainly there are people today, I've met many of them in my life, who do believe that that's pretty exactly what happened. Uh, you know, um, this, uh, this snake started talking in, in uh, fluent Hebrew to this woman. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and so on, Everything, just exactly the way it happened. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, in the, I guess in the 70s and 80s it was mainly, there was a series of books that for a while were bestsellers uh, about uh, urban legends. Um, and urban legends are stories, and they're very interesting stories. Um, in 1963, when I would have been about 18, uh, I was a newspaper reporter. I left, I left school at 17 and became a newspaper reporter. Um, and somebody came into the office one day and said, hey, did you hear about this woman? And he proceeded to tell me the following story. Those were the days when working class women in Britain wore bouffant head, uh, which were referred to uh, irreverently as beehive head. Uh, and in Britain, I have to explain that what's, what is in the United States called hairspray, in Britain at that time, probably still, but I don't know that for certain, was called lacquer. No. So these girls would spray their, get this bouffant head and spray it with lacquer. So he said, yeah, um, I, was li I was living and working in one West Midlands town called West Bromwich, and this was, this guy has spoke to me, said this was happened in Wensbury, which was another, West Midlands town, a few miles away, and he said that this, this, this woman was kept spraying and didn't ever disentangle it or wash her hair. Uh, and then she started having headaches. And then uh, she went to the doctor, and the doctor removed the, uh, 
the, the lacquered head of the prison of the circular saw or something. Um, and it found that it was crawling with these grubs. And furthermore, they'd eaten into her brain. Right? I, I, have to say, I have to say this, in the, they'd eaten into her brain, right? So that was, that was what, years later, years later, um, I read these books about urban legends, and there it was. That, that precise story cropped up all over the, the uh, industrialized world. <coughs> Wherever women had this particular head, which apparently was what, at the time, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it, it was open borders for headers. Um, so, uh, uh, but the interesting thing about that to me, looking back on it, is that story would be totally uninteresting to anybody unless you believed it was true. You know, if someone had said, hey, just imagine what might happen, you'd say, what, why, are you, why are you telling me this? But it was, it, it was an important story, and it spread like wildfire, and it grew, it grew. By the way, I should say that one of the things, that, if you read this literature on urban legends, um, is that it always comes with a guarantee of truth, which is usually, I saw it on TV, or I read it in the paper. Uh, and the, but the people who started writing these books about urban legends followed this up, and it was never, ever reported in the paper. Right? Or not, neither had it ever appeared on TV. The story just appeared along with the guarantee that it must be true because it was um, it had been reported on TV or, or, or in, in the paper. Uh, so that's the kind of story that uh, it, it, its interest lies entirely in the belief that it's true. Um, it's not, they're not really all that interesting stories. They have a certain interest now, looking back, because they were believed by millions of people. Uh, but, um, so that's, part, that's one way in which a story can have importance if you actually believe the story was true. Um, so many stories that people believe are true uh, are just impossible. They couldn't have happened, but people still believe them. Um, you know, in the, in the First World War in Britain, I remember there was an incident where it was, it was, um, it was believed that Russian troops had landed in the north of England. And you could tell they were from Russia because they still had snow on their boots. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, uh, that was reported in the papers and it was talked about and, and nobody s seemed to see any flaw in this theory. Uh, but anyway, um, the question arises, can you object to the way a story is interpreted? Can you object to the way a story is, is, is dealt with in the culture or by particular people? Let me give you a simple example. Um, in, in the year 1900, um, uh, Lyman Frank Baum wrote a book called The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Um, in 1939, they made a movie of it uh, called The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and in the book, um, Dorothy, the protagonist, uh, gets hold of these silver slippers. Now, in uh, 1939, when they made the movie, uh, they had just invented or innovated something called technical. And so it was, I'm guessing there was someone in the studio who said, silver slippers? Come on, we can make it more colorful than that. Why not? I know, red. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, red doesn't sound good. Scarlet? No, people think about Don the Wind. Um, Ruby? Oh yes, great. Give that man uh, 20,000 bucks a week extra. Uh, so so the, when they made the movie, it had ruby slippers. Now, is that an important change in the story? Anybody think that's a, a really important change in the story? Um, one thing that you have to know is that <laughs> there is quite a bit of scholarship which shows that the Wizard of Oz, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, the book, is a political allegory based on the election campaigns and the political issues of the 1890s. The yellow brick road is the gold standard. The Emerald City is this illusion created by greenbacks, where everything, uh, you lose your bearings and you're befuddled because you don't know what's what. Um, the Cowardly Lion is some um, William Jennings Bryan, who made the famous uh, Cross of Gold speech in 1896. 
you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, right? Now, it, it was a big issue, gold or silver. Uh, and uh, Brian, who was three times Democratic candidate uh, for president, but never elected president, although he later became Secretary of State, um, he was a big proponent of silver. So, okay, now it's a, it's a different, right? Maybe, maybe you're doing something seriously wrong by changing silver slippers to ruby slippers. But then you can look at it this way. All the evidence is that this was just a personal conceit of the author. In other words, he wasn't trying to send a message. Uh, uh, he, he didn't hope to convert people. And after all, he was quite free to write, and he had written articles favoring silver against gold earlier. Um, so, and, and this is corroborated by the fact that when he made a stage version of the story, which was more designed to attract adults. He didn't divulge this underlying allegory, but instead he just put in some topical, laugh-catching jokes, um, uh, political jokes, uh, without broaching this deep structure of uh, allegory. So, you know, uh, so first of all you think, uh, can't, silver to ruby can't mean anything, but then you think, well, maybe it does mean something. Uh, but then you think, well, no, it doesn't. So depending on the f all these facts. So whether a story can, is damaged by being tampered with depends on all kinds of facts that you ought to know. Um, <clears throat> uh, Animal Farm uh, is a, a story that made people think differently about the Soviet Union. Um, uh, children who read it sometimes find it an enjoyable story, but have no idea it has anything to do with Soviet Russia. It just doesn't cross, I mean, children, I'm talking about children. Uh, it, and I think this will increasingly become true with um, grown-ups, because as the Soviet Union recedes into the past, uh, it ceases to be all that significant. Uh, so um, Orwell was influenced in writing this alleg allegorical type of uh, prose by the biggest influence on his life, Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels. And there are all kinds of things in Gulliver's Travels which is fairly obvious are satirizing uh, various political developments and cultural developments of Jonathan Swift's time. Uh, but we don't know what they were. We've just forgotten all about them. And that will gradually, I think, as time goes on, as human civilization persists, which is always in doubt, uh, that, that people keep reading Animal Farm because it's a good story, but they'll gradually They'll have to be told in a footnote, and they'll be very impatient with it because it's so tiresome that it has something to do with the Russian Revolution, because no one will know about the Russian Revolution anymore. Uh, so, um, coming back to Jordan Peterson, um, it's possible that if you don't know a key fact or a bunch of facts, you will. Uh, completely misinterpret a story. Um, and I'm now going to mention something which, is, which serves two purposes. It illustrates this point about how you can, how you can uh, misinterpret a story, but it also influences, also uh, touches upon the, um, <clears throat> the limitations of Jordan Peterson's knowledge. Uh, one of the things that struck Jordan Peterson, as it struck many people who come from a post-Christian culture, post-Protestant culture, where there's all these bits of Protestantism flying around in the culture, but gradually less and less, and they know a bit, um, they remember a bit from when they went to the, He's old enough to have gone to Sunday school, and so on. Um, they come across the, uh, the, the crucifixion scene, where Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he, he cries out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, and <clears throat> Jordan Peterson tells us what this means. Uh, he says that, um, first of all, he, sh it's, he says it's very shocking because this is the Son of God. Um, actually, if you read the right Christian authors, it's God, <laughs> which is even more <laughs> remarkable. Um, uh, so it suggests a kind of schizoid state uh, in, 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 uh, in God. Um, but um, Peterson relates this to this Jungian idea that you only get to light when you get into the deepest darkness. That's one of Hume's ideas. Uh, so 
this becomes part of Peterson's theory, and it's sort of like um, you, do, you can't really uh, get enlightenment until you've touched bottom, until you've reached despair. Uh, now, I'm just going to quickly buzz you with a bit of New Testament 101, okay? Um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is a quotation. It's the opening line of Psalm 22. And um, it was would have been totally familiar to Mark and Matthew, who are the two gospel writers who, who give this story. Uh, and it would have been totally uh, familiar as a quotation uh, to their readers. Uh, you know, if, if, um, if someone says, um, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. You know that's a you know that's a quotation. You probably know where it's from, and you don't have to have it explained that what that means is that we're entering we've entered a world of enchantment where all the normal uh, laws of nature don't work anymore, uh, and we're dealing with a totally different world. That doesn't have to be explained. You take it for granted. Well, um, Christians tried to find predictions of Christ in the Old Testament. And one of the things they did was they worked on Psalm 22. Now, you can say that they pointed out how what had happened fulfilled the, the prophecy. Or if you're cynical, and a suspicious term of mind like me, you can say they made up the story so that it would fulfill an imagined prophecy which they imputed to this uh, old Jewish scripture. Uh, which is what I think happened in this case. So, um, Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The whole psalm gradually becomes more and more comforting and triumphant. Um, so, it doesn't take, the point is that Peterson is totally mis mistaken in thinking that Jesus is in despair when he says this. Uh, and other aspects of Psalm 22 are used in the Gospels to follow up on this. For example, uh, they have, um, they have uh, cast logs for my clothing, right? So you get the story in the Gospels where the Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' robe, right? So, um, uh, and there are all kinds of other uh, connections that show that this, this, this uh, story has been tailor-made to fit this supposed prediction. So, Peterson is just wrong to think that this is a picture of Jesus in despair. It's not. Uh, it's a picture of Jesus who knows what's coming and who is reciting Psalm 22. So, um, this, this is the kind of thing how a little bit of knowledge changes the way you take, um, the way you take a story. Thank you. Uh, the last thing I'm going to consider is, uh, is Peterson, Peterson's uh, treatment of... Um, the Abraham and Isaac story. Uh, in, in, in Genesis, Abraham uh, is very old, uh, and his wife is very old, and they, they've never had any children, and then they have a son when he's about 100 and she's about 75. Uh, and um, so, <coughs> if, you, if you, any of you are giving up hope, then um, uh, you can take hope, take, be encouraged by this. But, um, <coughs> Uh, and then, God says to Abraham, uh, <clears throat> I want you to go to this mountain, Moria, and I want you to um, uh, kill your son, Isaac, uh, and make a burnt offering of him. Uh, you know, so, of course, we're living in a culture, we're dealing in a culture here where animal sacrifices are going on every day to, because God likes uh, to smell burning flesh, I suppose. Um, and um, so God says to Abraham, well, I see I'm quoting Bob Dylan, kill me a son. <laughs> Abe says, where do you want this killing done? God says, well, Adam, I went 61. But anyway, this just shows how this story is in the culture. But um, uh, so what do we make of this? Uh, and what happens, of course, is that Abraham, uh, Abraham takes Isaac, and then they're with a company of people, but then they go off the two of them on their own. Uh, and they, uh, uh, they build a fire, get ready to build a fire, and then um, 
Abraham binds Isaac, gets his knife out, and God is still telling him, you've got to kill him and burn him. Uh, and then, at the very last minute, uh, God says, oh, I didn't really mean it. <laughs> or actually, the angel of, uh, of God. Uh, we, but that means the same thing. Angels are just instruments of God in the Old Testament. Do exactly what God tells them to say. Um, so, so, what do we make of this? Especially, what do we make of God letting Abraham think for an extended period of time that he's going to have to kill his son? Uh, and that this is a good thing to do. And that even though God intervenes at the last minute to stop the killing, uh, it's somehow praiseworthy as Abraham to have been willing to go through with it. So this has caused a lot of um, <coughs> this has caused a lot of uh, problems uh, in religious circles, especially Christian circles. But I don't know about Jewish circles. Quite possibly has. Uh, as people have been perplexed as to what this means. So um, what Peterson does in this case is um, <coughs> he does two things. First of all. He does relate it to how you want to live your life, like, he's, like he's, everything else he relates. But he also puts forward the following theory. He says that deferred gratification, putting off pleasure till tomorrow, is a very difficult concept to grasp. Uh, and the idea that you had to make a sacrifice in the present in order to get some benefit in the future was very slow in coming. Uh, and the only way it could come was by people thinking they made a bargain with God uh, where he would give them something in exchange for a sacrifice that they made now. He was going to give them something. Uh, that's the way they had to conceive it. Uh, so, I'm told that I'm rambling on too long, which is, uh, which with me is always a, uh, always a problem. Uh, so I'll quickly finish this point. Um, I think Peterson is completely wrong here, and the reason I think he's completely wrong is because for thousands of years before Abraham, if you think Abraham really existed, for thousands of years before Abraham, Talking to the mic, uh, for thousands of years before Abraham, people were routinely um, making provision for the future. Uh, I mean, for example, 30 years ago, people were building kilns to harden fire hard and play pots. 30,000 30, years ago. That's five times as long as fundamentalists think the world has existed. Uh, um, uh, the human, groups of humans were making kilns in order to fire pots that they made of clay. Uh, and you could go back to the stone axes which evolved for hundreds of thousands of years before that. So the whole idea that by the time of Abraham, let's say the second millennium BC, if that's if you think Abraham really existed, uh, that this would that be any difficulty about this is uh, is completely unconvincing. And the other the other thing is when he finally gets round to his what this means for us as a lesson, uh, he says that it's like when your when your child leaves home, that's the sacrifice you have to make. Well. <clears throat> I've had four children and they left home, and I didn't feel it was much of a sacrifice when they left. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, but anyway um, so that, uh, again, that's very, very unconvincing. And I think that the only way to interpret the story is that it's a relic of a time when people thought very differently, and the, the idea of being totally submissive to God was such an important value in that belief system that they, had, they made it such a point that you had to be prepared to kill your own offspring. Uh, that is a sign of your devotion to, to God. So I, I think it makes sense within the belief system. I don't think it's something that has any lessons for us today, uh, except um, what a hash you can make to interpret old stories so they fit up in certain places. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what I think about Jordan Peterson. Okay, let's go to questions right away. I've got the first one. Uh, for, for questions, I got the first one. Okay, you're talking about this guy, Jordan Peterson, when there's much more, something more interesting going on called the World Series. How is he relevant? That's not my game. I'm not even sure what game it is. Okay, okay, okay. I know, I know. All right, next. What? 
Serena. Uh, I just have to ask, particularly in the cosmos, you said that Jordan Peterson is a psychologist who at one point was practicing. Uh, psychologist, and I have to ask what his take, especially in the current environment, is on addiction. When we're in the middle of a massive uh, epidemic of opioid addiction, did he ever comment about that or write about it or talk about it? I have not, I uh, don't recollect seeing anything by him about the opioid crisis. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, the thing is this, he made his name as a, as a, a, a lecturer in psychology, a, a professor. He was at Harvard for a few years, uh, and he, he got a big reputation. He's getting he published a lot of articles. Um, sure, what would you like? Then, then he became famous because of this C-16, this gender pronoun bit. And now he's he's still they, uh, he's a professor at the University of Toronto. Yeah, you know what? I'm who correct, teaches psychology. Give me a minute, okay? I'm sorry, I'm the he's, only one. I know here, okay? he mentions that he has abandoned doing uh, psychotherapy. This is so not good. Clients anymore. I need so help he back here tonight. I got people coming in now ordering drinks and I'm collecting cash. Uh, so my money. Uh, Bible stories. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I, 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 I'm, he's, he produces such a lot of material. I mean, you go to YouTube, there's a couple of hours on an average every day, or maybe more, new now. from Jordan Peterson. And he quickly gets hundreds of thousands of followers, or viewers, and sometimes millions. Um, uh, and, but I don't recollect one about um, addiction specifically, or any kind of addiction. So I'm sure he has talked about addiction, but I don't know what he says. Charlie? Okay, yeah, Charlie. Thank you. In a week in which speech is conceivably responsible for the potential deaths of 12 or 14 people through bombing, the regulation of speech certainly sounds like a very good idea. Are you opposed to safety and security of human life? Are you opposed to human life? I don't think speech deprives people of free will. Next. No contributing factor. All right, next. Who's got the next question? All right. Who determines what you can and cannot say? You answer a question with a question? I'm asking you a question. It's not my problem. So you, so you don't know or you're not going to answer? This is the question for Dr. Steele. How about for Dr. Steele? Yeah, let's not get ragged here. Over here. So, Dr. Steele. Can you stand, please? Can you yes, get down, uh, Is part of part Peterson's doors? appeal just to be kind of the, I don't know, pop intellectual and not really his academic credentials? Is that part of what you're arguing, that he's filling the space of kind of like what William F. Buckley Jr. used to be, just like the guy who goes around <laughs> talking about anti-leftist or free market, but not exactly free market, just kind of anti-politically correct talking points, like uh, the way that Noam Chomsky doesn't really do linguistics, he just talks about foreign policy and economics that he doesn't really understand that well. Like this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm talking about this for where Karl Popper, I saw this on YouTube, one of your older lectures, it's not whatever his academic specialty was known for, it was his side job that Karl Popper was remembered for as, you know, sort of a civil libertarian advocate. Well, for what it's worth, uh, Camille Paglia uh, admires Jordan Peterson, and she says he's the most important Canadian public intellectual since Marshall McLuhan. Since who? Marshall McLuhan. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think I mean I think that's true. I think that um, uh, I don't think that Pete. I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but I don't believe that in recent years, last couple of years, Peterson has published much in the psychology journal. So he used to publish. He used to do a lot of research and publish a lot of articles. Uh, and I, I think he's basically, he has a teaching load at Toronto, and then he goes on tour and he makes these uh, lectures, and it's all about how uh, you ought to live your life. It's very pop. Uh, it's, um, uh, now, it, it's actually possible that, um, that, I mean, there, there obviously is going to come a point where he peaks, and where uh, it starts, it's, 
because he, get, he gets huge crowds at his meetings. You know. um, but it's possible that might have happened. He might have been. Um, I think it's, it's too soon to say, but it's possible. And if I may, a quick follow up. I know we're short on time. Is Ms. Paglia excluding Canadians like David Frum, who live and work largely in the United States? Yeah, I, I mean, or just doesn't like that America. was Camille's uh, view. It wasn't mine, uh, but I'm just reporting it as a sign of what how he's taken. Okay. I'm not forcing the votes on you. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> Margaret. Could you please define what you think his definition of politically correct is? Well, I imagine that uh, uh, if certain subjects are taboo and can't be discussed. Uh, he thinks that, uh, and I think the same. It's a bad thing, and we should be able to uh, to talk about those uh, subjects. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that, um, I mean, what, what's politically incorrect could be anything these days, right? It could be, uh, uh, I mean, the European Court has just uh, upheld the conviction of a woman who uh, put forward the opinion that, um, Mohammed's uh, marriage to a six-year-old was pedophilia. Uh, so because she said that, she was, she was prosecuted, convicted, she appealed to the European Supreme Court, and they've upheld the, convic the conviction. So I would say that's an example of political correctness. You can't say that about, um, about uh, Islam. The one question, uh, we have a full house here tonight. Before we go on with a lot more questions, how many people want to give some sort of rebuttal here tonight? Keep your hands up and let me get an accurate count, please. One. And the, the on-deck circle like baseball will be right over here on the rail. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. On the rail out here. Anybody out in uh, the, you guys want to give a rebuttal? What is that? Ten, ten people? I mean, eleven. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, does, are we, are we, another five minutes for questions, and then we'll start the rebuttals. Okay. Uh, who else has a question? Uh, Ellen, you got a question okay, back there? Um, Can you stand? I just happened to hear a couple of minutes of uh, Jordan uh, Peterson on some YouTube video. So he, my think <coughs> what he was saying was that men and women working together in the workplace is not working because of all huh. these, I suppose because of all these charges of sexual harassment. And that uh, one thing he was suggesting or, is that women not wear makeup in the workplace because they're sexualizing themselves. And um, I, I was just wondering what, what you think. I mean, what you think of this idea is that it's not working, men and women being together in the workplace. And, well, and that it's something that's kind of um, it, it's, uh, it seems to be working okay to me. I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I think women want to wear makeup, or men want to wear makeup for that matter. I, I have no objection. Um, uh, I mean, actually, but that's an interesting thing about Peterson's thinking. Um, he actually said in one of these conversations, I, you, I mean, you shouldn't hold people too closely to what they say in the heat of a, of a, a lively discussion, but he, he said that. He um, brought that, uh, what a surprise. That women, that the purpose of makeup is to send a signal of sexual availability, like red cheeks and so on, uh, is, is all, all signs of sexual arousal. Uh, and he said, therefore, that women who do this put on makeup, they're being hypocritical if they object to men taking an interest in them. Um, and that's actually, I think, a mistake he makes in his thinking. That he thinks that because we have a Darwinian uh, proclivity to do something, therefore it's part of our consciousness. Uh, whereas I would say that uh, millions of years of natural selection have made us have certain urges and certain tendencies in our behavior, but we may not, we may not be conscious of them. We, and, and our conscious awareness has nothing necessarily to do with the, with the evolutionary reason why we do those things. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that struck me when I heard him say this about makeup was that women don't, if you think that women uh, <clears throat> beautify themselves because they care about what men think, you haven't listened to women. Uh, because it's clear, if you listen to women, that they care more about what other women think than what men think. 
Um, or most of them. Uh, it's difficult to generalize. Uh, but um, uh, so, you know, I, th I, I think that, uh, that, that uh, he has a rather mechanical view of evolution. Uh, evolutionary. I think evolutionary psychology is perfectly le legitimate, but I think that um, he has a rather simple minded view of it. Charlie? Yes, if, he's, if one, someone speaks incorrectly, aren't they in fact encouraging and fostering discrimination? Are you in favor of discrimination? <laughs> is, that is that a libertarian concept? Well, I'm in favor of the free to discriminate, if that's what you're asking. Well, if you speak incorrectly, you are speaking as one who discriminates. What's here? You're speaking as one who discriminates. Yeah, yeah, I You're marginalizing time and everything I do. Yeah. When you speak incorrectly. You said you couldn't define incorrect speech. Yeah, when you marginalize a group un unreasonably. You couldn't find a definition for who, who am I marginalizing? When you speak and when one person speaks incorrectly. They generally are talking about a religious, ethnic group, whatever. <coughs> Disparaging remarks aimed to hurt or harm a group. Well, and you like allow it. that kind of speech to libertarians? Oh, I, I mean, Say I wouldn't probably do, but I'm not, I'm not sure why you're asking me. I mean, I don't, I don't go around and start trying to hurt groups or anything well, like that. All right, what does Patterson do? All right. All right, let's give our speaker a hand. And we'll All right. Good job, David. Let's get you uh, sit down and get you a meal now so you can get all this uh, deep thought coming up in the rebuttals. Hopefully we can uh, rebut Charlie's remarks. Uh, there's an open chair somewhere, I'm sure. Thank you. I'm right. sure you're right. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really had a point that, that two things really distracted me. Uh, the idea that men and women, sh uh, that women should not wear makeup at work, and then I think you have to forbid men to wear dress suits with a tie, which is their symbol of taking over the uh, female um, genitalia. I mean, this is a symbol of their assumption of uh, and power over females. So they have to quit wearing that if women have to quit wearing uh, makeup. And then the second thing um, was, um, oh, the very last comment, I can't remember it right now, but I'm so interested in that story from Genesis uh, where the, the, the chaos was upon the face of the deep and um, that... Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, this story is a story that I, I believe these stories are brought forward in modern times because they have uh, a meaning, and anybody who uses the story uses it in the way that makes sense to them now. It doesn't matter how old the story is if you incorporate it, if you're interpreting it now. So I believe that chaos was on the face of the deep when the universe was created and uh, 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 biota was not able to develop on the earth because there was so much radiation and there was too much um, gamma rays and alpha rays and beta rays for, uh, for, for DNA to start or RNA and eventually about 4.5 million billion years ago I believe um, billion, yeah, 4.5 billion years ago this was brought under control. Uh, there was no more plutonium. Plutonium was all gone. Um, and the, the um, highest thing on the periodic table, which didn't exist at the time, of course, was uranium. And, uh, and then and now, today, well, anyway, from that happened, evolution was able to start. Today, we have brought back all of the stuff that created that chaos on the face of the deep. We've brought back plutonium, we've brought back americium, we've brought back all kinds of things that were all gone before biology could even get started. And now we're stuck with it, and we don't know what to do with it. We've got 80,000 pounds of nuclear waste, 
and what the hell are we going to do with it? So I just wanted to, uh, I could go into much more detail about the details of the Garden of Eden story and how I interpret that as an anti-nuclear activist. I'm a fanatic, and um, I don't know, I don't think I have time. Okay. All right. Oh, I, I just want to say I thought this program tonight was one of the best we ever had. I love this. For thirty-five hundred, that's here, a great here. one. Here, here. <laughs> I've been coming to these things for a few years now, and this just comes to me. We're, we're not old, not all old, but anyway, I wrote this poem. <laughs> Angry old men. Angry old men. What is there to be angry about? Yeah, that stick doesn't work right anymore. And maybe those women don't come around as much anymore. And if they did, maybe you don't care anyway. There are other things uh, to get excited about. Like those issues all around you that you keep yelling about. The ideas, hurts, and injustice that are not being addressed. And you're still alive after all these years, so speak up and say what you have to say. Put your two cents in before you die and pass your concerns to new generations. But watch out, your blood pressure may be too high, so maybe you can only last a few more days. And I will listen and say thank you. Okay. We are we are running a four minute clock, so you know. There's a lot of things I could say. Obviously, Jordan Peterson is a real schmuck, and obviously nobody likes to be told how to live their life, least of all me. However, and this is for you libertarians. We do need we do need to have government more than ever. There's a lot of crazy people running around with guns. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, gun control. Yeah. 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 All right. Those crazy people's guns. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I got a time out. Oh, I just want to see it. Okay, okay well, here. I'd like to thank Dr. Steele. Um, Charlie, we don't really need a lot of crocodile tears about restricting speech when we know the radical left can also have violent rhetoric, and they shot up that congressional baseball game practice that I don't even vote for the GOP anymore, but that was also done in recent times. Uh, yep, yeah, shut. My turn. Now, if you like Pritzker, he... Fair enough, I'm sorry about that, Andy. Uh, Pritzker inherited, what, six or seven times as much money as Rauner made? Give me a break. That's my critique of the mainstream center-left as opposed to the far left. I'll try and keep that fast. Uh, I'm wearing Bubba Harshi's t-shirt tonight. Anti-drug war candidate for attorney general. Far more interesting than anything coming out of the two major parties. Uh, as well as the rest of our slate. Talk to Steve Dutner for Secretary of State over there. And of course, Cash Jackson and Sanj Mohib for Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Um, Peterson is kind of interesting to me, and he bothers me too. I like the good and bad approach because there's this whole category, and Dave Rubin's interview guests on his podcast are an unusual mix of individualists and alt writers. And, uh, you know, I don't like the alt right, I don't like the anti-immigrant sentiment in it, and it can be the blurring of what's going on in the intellectual traditions, um, and in the ideologies, and the melting of one movement, and it's slopping into another like two puddles. And we're seeing that happening with the populist right and the populist left, which is a damned shame, if you ask me. And that's going to be the challenge of the next generation, um, and many years to come, presuming we're all still alive. Uh, and I'm going to keep this short. I am now a father. I'm very tired. My daughter was born six nights ago at 8.31 p.m. Surely, I'm sorry if I was too hard on you. And thank you, David. She's going to grow up to be a Democrat. <laughs> she just might. All right, Sid. Now, we're living uh, in very trying times, and we don't know whether or not humanity will keep living under present circumstances. 
And if we look at the West, and particularly the United States, what we find, they're doing the least to solve this problem. And under our present government, the uh, president is actually a, so a sociopath and a complete liar, and he can't believe anything he ever says. And the Republican Party is morphed into a fascist party. And we're going in that direction. You can see that right now. What happened in the last few days with this guy sending these bombs, and he was from the extreme right. Another thing that happened, of course, in uh, Pittsburgh, this guy shot all these people, killed 11 people, also from the extreme right, because uh, Trump has given them permission, more or less, to do that. And he won't take no responsibility for what he's doing and the Republican Party won't do anything against them because they actually believe in the same thing, but they use more moderate language. So we're in a real uh, problem trying to solve a huge problem. And in Germany, you have, uh, is about the only capitalist country that is using solar panels on a higher degree, but what I now, now understand that they're coming back to coal to a certain degree. So the only real power that's actually doing anything is China. China produces more solar panels than every other country combined and plans to double that within the next five to ten years and go to uh, ecological development where you don't need fossil fuels that we can use natural energy from solar, hydro, and wind power. So they're, they're going ahead and let's hope we could solve this problem. And they're also one of the leading builders of nuclear reactors in the world right now too to solve their energy problem. Wait a minute, I'm talking, you talk. Yeah. So, um, so we have to have, um, we have to look forward, we have to look forward to China as giving an example of what socialism could actually do because the Soviet Union couldn't do it. So it's, it's looking into the problems the Soviet Union had and trying to resolve those problems. Like anything else, if you want to solve a problem, you have to have a problem to begin with. So it's forging ahead. And, and I think this is the uh, future if we don't destroy ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll that. All right. It's a funny thing. People who believe we should stifle free speech can just start with themselves and shut the hell up. <laughs> Get out of here. That includes you, Charlie. That's the door. You are the ash heap of history, sir. Yes. All right. All right. Good evening. I'm David Travis. I'd kind of like to make a point of clarification here. One is that uh, the, the devil. Um, Satan, uh, according to the story originally, was that God wanted to keep man in a state of ignorance and obedience. Uh, I believe I'm talking here, so if you people over there can shut up. Uh, God wanted to keep man in a state of ignorance and uh, obedience, and um, uh, Lucifer, who, according to Ayn Rand, pointed out that the name Lucifer means light bearer, light being knowledge, and that uh, Satan wanted uh, Adam and Eve to be enlightened. 
And so he tempted them so that they would have knowledge of good and evil, which was a, shall we say, a start. Uh, uh, this was never mentioned tonight, but that um, uh, the devil, with, without the devil, without Satan, uh, man would not have been enlightened. And if man had not been enlightened, it would have just gone on forever for them to be the way they were. So I simply wanted to point out that uh, there are other points of view on this. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right. Beyond deck circle. All right. 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 Uh, regarding the death of traditional media, newspapers, and TV, <laughs> whose dominant role in public debate has been taken over by sites like YouTube and Twitter, which are themselves questionable. YouTube is described as pushing politically extreme content and deforming reality to encourage people to watch them. <laughs> The dominant role uh, in public debate, therefore, remains with newspapers, which can better report um, because they don't require uh, uh, extremist information to keep our attention. Because we read newspapers to learn to become informed, not to be entertained. I'll read your That's it. Oh. 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 All right, I'll go a little bit earlier. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, David, for a very good speech. Let's thank our speaker. And uh, you gave a nice write up there. Uh, anyhow, on a week in which speech is held accountable for uh, the reason that the lives of 12 or 14 people were put in danger. A guy shows up and says, oh, that was okay. That was okay to do, you know. Uh, speak all you want. You don't put more lives in danger. No, uh, speech cannot be, ex no right, and in particular speech, no right, is exercised in the absolute. Um, and only speech speech of value, by the way, is protected by the Constitution of the United States. So speech that has no value, uh, uh, in fact, can be censored. Uh, and certainly, speech that results in violence can and must should be censored. Uh, I spoke here about the evolution of cultures and tribes many years ago. And they reach a certain level of civility. And uh, the manners of exchanges of society get redefined or refined the higher you go and the longer, the higher they are as civilizations or cultures. And we like to think that we're uh, at the forefront of this regard of civility. What, what is civil means civilization? What is not 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 tribalism. 
Um, the other thing is, we had an individual here. The one thing, another thing I know quite well as a representative of employees is that speech at work is restricted. Once you cross the portal of the workplace, you cannot say what you want. You cannot give your opinion to your supervisor or so forth. You do not have free speech at work. The President of the United States, when he gives a speech, is a federal employee at work. He is representing an institution. He is a spokesperson for an institution. I know that for myself, having been in a bureaucracy, that only certain individuals are selected and authorized to speak for the institution because they are giving voice and enunciation to the policy of the United States. Now, the President of the United States gets up there, and I don't know if you've seen the totality of the videos of some of the things, the statements that were made during his speeches and these crazy things he does on the road. But there's certainly not, they're well beyond the measure of professionalism, and they certainly are well beyond the office of the presidency of the United States. He is not speaking for me. And as a matter of fact, this should be degraded. I'm sorry, I don't know where the political people are that say, this is not how you do conduct yourself. This is, no one, anybody who spoke like this, even in the office, would be called in. You cannot do this kind of thing. And certainly once you begin cross the, the, the area of violence, now an individual took his advice. He was marginalizing people, which is incorrect. I said political speech is marginalizing people, and he identified particular groups and individuals as the worst type of people. He defined them as enemies of the people of which we, something should be done about that. And he gave audit, audit authority of, of some, anyone, or any party in that audience. He authorized them to take action to eliminate for the safety of the United States. And this guy should not be told, hey, pal, aren't you little nuts? No, it's not for, come on, you grow up, you wouldn't want a child to say that. Anyhow. That's pretty good. That was all fun, though. I enjoyed it. Good to see you again. And let me know when you got another one in you, David. I always enjoy seeing you here. And my libertarian pals, too. <laughs> good luck, guys. Harvey Weinstein and Presidents agreed. Yeah. Hello, hi. I just want to say a few words. Um, there's an election coming up, and um, I hope you all vote. Um, there are some, uh, if, I, I don't know, if the, if the Republicans remain um, in control of the House and the Senate, um, you know, they may try to repeal health care more, um, do other bad things. Um, so I do encourage everyone to vote. Um, I wanted to say that I had watched, um, you know, President Trump, um, I was very disturbed that he, there, there was a senator, or a congressperson, I'm not sure um, who it was, um, and he um, body slammed a reporter. And then President Trump was introducing this guy and was basically praising him for body slamming the reporter. Now, it's a fact that he did body slam the reporter. He was convicted of body slamming the reporter. He was, you know, fined and, and things of that nature. Um, and I, I thought that was incredibly despicable of President Trump to be praising um, the body slamming of a reporter for just doing his job and asking questions. Um, this is um, a threat to the First Amendment. Um, basically, you're, you're encouraging the intimidation and violence against reporters um, in order to, I suppose, get them to curtail their, their um, reporting. Um, so this, this is a very serious issue. Um, and I was very disturbed, and, and, and you can see it on um, YouTube, um, clearly. Um, and then um, another thing that I was um, looking at was, um, I was, I do recommend um, looking um, at The Intercept, um, particularly Glenn Greenwald. 
uh, the man who broke the Edward Snowden story. And he was talking, uh, his most recent blog was about how um, the Washington Post, um, MSNBC, I believe, as well, and some other, uh, a variety of, of uh, news outlets, they're putting commentators on and making them seem like they're neutral parties, like neutral academics or, or whatever. And they're actually, you know, they're generally Americans, but they're actually paid Saudi or um, lobbyists, or pa paid lobbyists um, from the United Arab Emirates. Um, so they're being paid like $10,000 a month, or maybe $15,000 $15, a month um, by Saudi Arabia. And then uh, we think they're neutral parties, and they're commenting about uh, the death of Khashoggi, and we think they're neutral when they're not. And, and I just, I mean, this is just outrageous that this information is not being disclosed. Um, okay, that's all I want to say. Um, and by the way, about that comment I made, I, I do think there, uh, you know, when a woman wears makeup, it is not necessarily because she's trying to, sometimes she's trying to attract men, other times it may be that she's just trying to fit in, or it's like a, a traditional habit, and yeah, fitting in and, and things like that. So I think, you know, you had a good point there. Okay, thank you. All right, next, please. Yeah. Uh, just wrap a couple up, words on the election. Wrap that, wrap all, okay. Is that, is that a better way? All right. We know the election is coming up, and we all know that if we're good citizens, we're going to get out there and vote. But for those of us who live in Illinois, particularly in certain districts, I'm going to make a, a rash statement here. There's something much more important than voting. It's not even all that important that you vote in many places where you live, because we know who the candidates are they're going to win. Most Dems in the Chicago are going to win with 60, 70, 80 percent of the vote. But what is important is there are, uh, the House of Representatives is up for grabs. There are somewhere between 30 and 60 districts throughout the United States that are within one or two or three points. Uh, and we can all, well with the internet and with long since unlimited phone calling, we can all participate. So here's what I'm going to say, what's even more important than going to the polls and voting yourself is get in touch with your local Democratic office. And if you happen to be Republican, you can do that too, but I'm not going to go out of my way to encourage that. Uh, get in touch with your local Democratic office or whatever party and offer to go down. And they will, they will help you. Tell them, however, you do not necessarily want to canvas for a phone bank for the local candidate who's going to get 70 or 80 percent of the vote anyway. You want to canvas for somebody like Sean Caston, who's in a in a on again off again race in the sixth district, or or uh, Underwood, uh, Lauren Underwood, who is also very close, and there are races in the United States uh, that are separated by less than one point between the Democrat and the Republican. You can find out where those races are. Try to get your local office to get a list and let them set you up so you can phone bank. And, and help that way. So that you, if you influence three or four people to go to the polls who might not otherwise have done so, you will have done more good than voting yourself. Thank you. All right, next. 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 <laughs> yes. Be a part of that. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to make a brief um, comment. I uh, bought a copy of Jordan's book, and I read most of it, and I found it basically incomprehensible. <laughs> Any of the principles involved with working on the major crises and uh, problems that humanity has right now. In America, the number one problem we have right now is we have no president. We have a corporate criminal con man who should be in jail. Uh, he's been installed through massive treasonal activity, vote suppression, and everything else. He was not elected. And uh, the mainstream media, as I pointed out, for those of you that haven't cracked a book lately on anything that's relevant 
to what's going on, I would suggest getting a copy of Censored News and digest it from cover to cover because it, it gives you the difference between the corp it's not corporate media, it's main, um, the mainstream media is no longer mainstream media. It's corporate billionaire dominated media where the talking heads on TV and radio are paid to maintain us in a bubble of ignorance as long as they can. Now, some people step through the bubble and look at reality, and they learn what happened on 9-11. A veteran's coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq are helping people step through the bubble and learn that our military is not fighting for freedom and justice anywhere in the world. They're slaughtering women and children and moving off the oil fields and other resource places where the billionaires want to take over and dominate resources in other countries. So, Common Dreams is the best news site that I know of. Common Dreams and Truth Out are two of the very best that give you actual, up-to-date, reality-based news every day. There's a website for young people. If you want to know where the hope is for the future, log on to a website called Sunrise Movement. It's an army of young people. They're not Democrat or Republican. They're not political. They're saying, we're an army of young people that we're going to vote out anybody that doesn't want to fight for our future. Their mission statement says, basically, as young people, we have no future. The kind of, in, in, in reference to what David Ramsey Steele has been saying, that the, the estimates on climate change were all wrong. Well, the climate scientists are saying that now. Their estimates for the last 20 years, 30 years, their computer models have been wrong. Each year, they update the numbers. And listen to this. Each year, they update the numbers and say, we were wrong. It's happening faster than what we thought. The ice is melting faster at the south and the north pole than what we thought. It's absolute insanity to stand up at any microphone anywhere and claim that we do not have a massive problem with global warming and climate change. The U.S. military says that's the number one threat to America now. It's not terrorism. It's not Muslims. We're living in a total bubble of mythology to keep the military-industrial complex going, making huge billionaire profits. Incidentally, on Common Dreams today, there's an article that says, in the last year, in the year of 2017, the billionaires in America have more money transferred to them than since the robber baron years, 100 years ago. The billionaires are getting richer and richer, faster and faster, and they are eliminating the middle class by killing the environment and foreclosing the future of kids that are 3, 4, 10 years old right now. That's where we are. We don't need to be spending hours and hours and hours trying to figure out what uh, Ann Rand or Jordan, you know, uh, all these other people, the intellectuals supposedly, are thinking when they're wasting our time when we should be looking at critical problems. That's my take on it. Thank you. All right, Brom. Andy, bring Brom the microphone. Yes, Brom. <laughs> bring Brom the microphone so you do a rebuttal. All right. All right. The lefties are winning tonight. I want to thank uh, David for giving us a, a thoughtful and uh, interesting uh, rendition of uh, his impressions of of uh, Jordan Peterson. But uh, I, while uh, his uh, uh, in-depth uh, analysis of what uh, Jordan uh, has to say was pretty good. Uh, it didn't uh, touch too much on the, uh, the implications of his uh, criticisms of the left and uh, their appeal to, to uh, the broader society or certain elements in the broader society. But particularly, um, I understand that he uh, is critical of uh, homosexuality generally. And uh, whatever you think of homosexuality generally, uh, uh, that uh, can uh, in be uh, very uh, dangerous uh, for a lot of people. And uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, say, uh, as far as supporting the Democratic Party, yes, you sometimes have to do to some extent. Uh, but I, uh, 
I would rather vote for what I do want when I can <laughs> than for what I don't want and get it. <laughs> And that's uh, what, uh, unfortunately, you have to do when uh, supporting uh, the Democratic uh, candidates. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to go next. Uh, is there anybody left that uh, rebuttal? I'd like to go next real quick. Yes. Andy. Yes. Well, frankly, I'm going to be here to balance out that opinion, Charlie, because the one thing you guys don't know is really how the world works. It ain't no socialist utopia. It ain't no darn uh, lefty kumbaya moments of where they want to take us. Really, the world, the way the world works, it's all driven by a system called capitalism. And capitalism has delivered the goods. It's brought more people out of poverty. It's created more jobs. It's created innovative companies. It's done more to save the world and bring people into, into the modern era than any other system around. And if you dare challenge me on it, I will be more than happy to show you the statistics. How many children there are employed? Well, Charlie, I'll tell you what. There's more children today because of capitalism not working in the show me fields. The statistics. Charlie, we've Mom, had a great so rise in population, and most of those children are now going to school. And I'll tell you what, you want more of them going to school, you get some good governance in the country along with some good capitalistic principles, and you'll see the end of sweatshops. You'll see more kids going to school. You'll see a lot more prosperity throughout the rest of the world. Anytime socialism has started, it, it does something to people. People have, people in a lot of ways want material wealth. They want to better their lives. And it's, it, whether it's socialist or capitalist, capitalism will deliver the goods. Remember, it's not the book, it's not the, it's not the bookmaker, the bread maker, or the candlestick maker that go to work to satisfy the intrinsic needs of others. They do so because they make money and can provide for themselves, and people want their goods. Why do they have guard fences around the factories in China? <laughs> because, Charlie, those owners are making money. And the thing is, China yeah, is liberalizing. <laughs> they're liberalizing, their wages are rising, companies are not going to be places like Vietnam to get the cheaper labor. They are rising in a capitalistic sense. Their last 30 years have been driven by capitalism. When Mao was there, what was it? Just nothing but a bunch of uh, totalitarian regimes under the... Uh, under, under, under the, what they, I forget what the name of that revolution was in the 60s. But since he was ousted out of power and Deng Xiaoping brought in the capitalistic principles, China prospered. As a matter of fact, they're using our own formula to prosper. They do a better job now with capitalism than we did, than we're doing. We're doing nothing but selling our intellectual property, degrading our corporations, and because of the corruptness of some of these American corporations, they'll be out of business soon, and they'll be replaced, just like it's supposed to be. Anyway, you know, the thing is, if you guys really want a good climate, really good prosperity, try capitalism. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Not sharing an opinion here at all, just wanted to read something. Okay. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion yes. or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech yes. or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble, to assemble and the petition the government for a redress of grievances. It's not an opinion. Yes. Here, here. Here, here. All right. All right, Margaret. Margaret. Okay. <laughs> well, this is not planned, so there you go. Um, I, I think uh, 
the assertion that capitalism is going to solve our problems has obviously not happened. And so um, I think that uh, if you give unfettered capitalism um, and leave it unfettered, you have things like uh, the Bakken oil fields that's totally destroyed the uh, uh, acres and thousands of acres of land up in um, Alberta, Canada, you, and, and many, many leaks from the pipelines that have polluted the waters. You have the um, lead in the water in Flint, Michigan, where you, you have a whole generation of children whose brains are permanently damaged from high levels of lead because the, uh, the whole uh, thing about privatizing the water and stuff. You have the Chicago Public School System whose um, who's, uh, people, the, the, the daily and Emmanuel administration and um, the, the people who have been in power in Chicago have systematically um, shredded the schools and tried to privatize things uh, for pro to make schools, public schools for profit that, so that um, uh, private companies could profit from teaching children. And, um, and you have a generation of children now in Michigan, the home state of Betsy, expletive deleted DeVos, <laughs> who um, instituted charter schools there and drove Michigan, uh, the, the uh, educational accomplishments of children in Michigan, from more or less being in the middle, kind of average sort of, to down to the bottom. We have the state of Illinois that's the 48th or 50th in the amount of money that we, give it, that we do to education to children. And we have a whole generation of children here in Chicago who have physically, emotionally, and psychologically have um, been destroyed because people wanted to make money, whether it was real estate interests or um, whoever was in power at the time, power of things. Um, I, I don't, and you have a people, people who are not, are, aren't getting health care you have 40,000 people a year who die because they do not have health insurance. And uh, so we've, we've left the wolves in charge of the um, candy store. I'm mixing my metaphors, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, um, and when people talk about uh, socialism, they talk about China, and they talk about uh, for our socialist governments, and maybe they even talk about Nazi Germany when they talk about socialism. But um, of course, Hitler never gave the power of the companies to the government in, in Germany. But if you do, but if you talk about the, so, the democratic socialism that's in the um, Scandinavia, for example, they really they, they really don't have as much poverty. And and there was a recent study that. Um, correlated violence in a society with the income gaps that just came out. So the greater the income gap, and it fits almost perfectly, um, the, the more violence there is in the society. And it's not poverty per se, but the income gap, or the perceived income gap between the lowest and the highest, and the, um, and if people are, in, and also I think poverty is a little bit correlated with it, because if you don't have enough to eat and your children don't have enough to eat, then you're probably more likely to be violent than not. And then to end on a high note, I would just like um, your poem about the getting on with George Burns after he turned 100 said, I still go down to the park and sit on the bench and watch the girls, but I forgot why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Rowdy Knight is a diamond. You got it, Andy? Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Yes. Well, I'm just going to respond to a number of points that have been made. Um, somebody said that the Republican Party was becoming uh, the fascist party. I just don't see that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member, nor am I a supporter of the Republican Party. But um, part of fascism is a one-party state, so that means making alternative parties to the one party illegal. Um, and I don't see that happening. I don't, and, um, uh, so it just seems to me to be a strange assertion. Um, <clears throat> the, the point was made about Lucifer. Actually, um, when Christians invented the idea of the devil, they looked to the Old Testament since Christianity presents itself as being the fruition of the Old Testament. And they came up with this, um, it's in uh, Isaiah 14, uh, reference to Lucifer. Um, and um, Lucifer uh, was the name for the morning star. Uh, and we now know what they didn't know, which is that the morning star and the evening star are the same object. Uh, we know that the uh, wandering stars are much closer and much smaller than the fixed stars, as they used to be called. Um, and the reference to Lucifer, the morning star in Isaiah, what Americans call Isaiah um, 14, is um, a reference to the Babylonian Empire. It has nothing to do with Satan or a devil or anything like that. Uh, just read it. I mean, you know, the, um, this, uh, the, a lot of these Christian, uh, when the Christians tried to find things in the Old Testament that would support their position, it's what Huck Finn would call a stretch. Uh, <laughs> and that's one of them. It's a stretch. Uh, and um, it has nothing to do with... Um, and I, I like the idea of Lucifer being a light bringer and that we ought to therefore worship the devil, but I can't buy it because the Lu Lucifer is just the planet Venus. With the morning star and the evening star, we now know the planet Venus. So that's, what, that's all that is. That's what that's about. And it's about the Babylonian Empire. And of course, um, I, I mean... Um, Isaiah was sort of fixed up to make it look like it was written a lot earlier and predicted the Babylonian Empire. Of course, it was actually written after the Babylonian at the time of the downfall, at least, or even later, of the Babylonian Empire. So it's a, a fake fulfilled prophecy. Um, so um, somebody said that uh, YouTube uh, objected to the idea that YouTube is replacing. I think. I think, uh, first of all, I think it's objectively true. Whatever you think of it, you might think it's terrible. But I think that the traditional media, like uh, cable TV and newspapers, are, are shrinking rapidly as, uh, as influ influences. And the um, uh, media like YouTube are, are, are expanding in their influence. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things about this is that when YouTube started, and of course there are, uh, there are alternatives to YouTube, but if YouTube becomes too onerous in its regulations or something, you might find one of these other things uh, expands in, in competition with it. But um, I, I, I look at YouTube quite a lot. Uh, for, um, I mean, for one thing, I can get any program uh, from the networks, or the cable networks, from CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, oh, yeah. or any of those, I can get them on YouTube. Yeah, but I can get them as uh, when I want to watch them. Uh, and um, uh, but when when YouTube got going, people assumed it would be consist of brief, entertaining things. And it, in fact, one one of the things that's happened with YouTube, well, for instance, uh, these talks at the College of Complex is going on. Yes. Um, and um, uh, there's an appetite for long. Uh, detailed discussions which people didn't know existed. Um, and so, so Jordan Peterson, some people might dislike Jordan Peterson, they don't have to know. Some people like, like and, I'm, and I'm sort of interested in Jordan Peterson as a cultural phenomenon, so I watch a lot of what he does. Uh, but you said you have hours and hours now. There was a time when the time used to be restricted. Uh, but now you can have hours and hours. 
and there is nothing particularly <laughs> extreme about um, the views on YouTube. There are extremes all over the place, but most of the stuff isn't extreme. It's just a, it's just a, a spectrum of all the opinions that exist. Um, so, uh, uh, on the whole, I think it's um, it's a it's a convenient thing for me because I can watch what I choose to watch when I feel like it instead of having to catch that thing on the time. Um, so um, Charlie spoke about uh, speech putting lives in danger. Well, I think that's always been true. It's always been true that if uh, somebody says something that's inflammatory, somebody else might act on it. But I think. I think it, it, you have to distinguish between actually giving an instruction, why don't you go and uh, shoot up that cinema or whatever it is, uh, and just making a vague sort of uh, uh, general statement. You might say the vague general statement might inspire someone to go and shoot up some building, but um, uh, the, pe the people responsible are the people who actually do the shooting up, not the people who talk about it. Um, <coughs> So, um, well, you know what I think about uh, global warming. I think it's, um, it's a delusion, and uh, uh, I think that uh, one, one of the things that you see when you, uh, as they, uh, they keep revising this, is they keep, it's always about 10 years in the future. Like 20 years ago, it was about 10 years in the future when the crisis was going to come. Uh, it never does come. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not getting, getting warmer or uh, anything like the rate that they predicted. So the predictions are always wrong and always in the same direction. Um, now, um, somebody said something about uh, Peterson being uh, critical of homosexuality generally. That's not true. I mean, he isn't. I mean, um, uh, he, the, the guy he tours with, uh, Dave Rubin, is, uh, is a, you know, in a same-sex marriage. And uh, a lot of uh, Peterson's friends and associates are homosexuals. And so, um, you know, he's, uh, he's very pro-gay. I've never heard him say anything remotely. I'd be amazed if he ever said anything remotely critical of homosexuality. I mean, I think he knows, as I know, that homosexuality is like left-handedness. It's a, it's a genetic condition. Um, and uh, some people roll that way, <laughs> other people roll in the other way. So um, uh, that, and, uh, they should be free to uh, right. pursue their particular inclination. Okay, Dave, we have uh, to wrap it up really uh, quick. Yes. Okay, well, all I would say about capitalism is that where is the alternative? Uh, I mean, the Scandinavian countries are capitalist countries. That is to say, the vast majority of the means of production are owned by private shareholders. Uh, and the, the degree of government involvement and the degree of welfare provision is roughly the same as in the United States. Um, in fact, the United States actually has more, a bigger welfare, more generous welfare state than Scandinavian countries. So um, uh, the idea that that is something so-called socialism, if, if you call welfare state capitalism uh, with, a great, with a high degree of regulation and high taxation uh, socialism, then the United States is socialist. If you don't call that socialism, then Scandinavia is not socialist. So, <clears throat> All right. Let's thank David. Thank you. Yeah, really good. One final 10 second announcement. Uh, for those of you that uh, made some Xerox copies, here's a 20 page copy of a questionnaire that was sent out to a bunch of world famous scientists. And the question was when did you become aware that 9 11 was an inside job? Uh. So everybody wants a copy of that and made 20 copies. Because that's a driving force behind why Trump is in office. It started on 9 11. We had eight years of Bush crimes, eight years of Obama wars, and now we got Trump. So a lot of us are saying we don't have a We don't puncture that myth. We're not going to make any progress. So that's it for tonight. We'll see you all next week.